Although most of our coverage this semester will center on the bacterial and the archaeal world, we will talk about eukaryotic microorganisms. And that's our goal at this point, is to move our coverage from prokaryotic cell structure and function to talking about the eukaryotic world and to think a little bit about the microbial life that represents this domain of life. First of all, I think it's important to say that the eukaryotic world is very diverse. And the things that we can see in that world vary all the way from microorganisms such as paramecium that you see on the left here, the upper left. Of course, this is a unicellular organism that on its own seeks and ingests its own food. Very different from a cheek cell that we see up on the upper right there that's part of a larger multicellular organism in which it is a differentiated cell. Now on the lower right, we see things like a yeast cell and on the lower left, a diatom. These two are similar to paramecium in that they're unicellular organisms, but unlike paramecium, they, in the case of the diatoms, are photosynthetic, so we recognize them as having a photosynthetic pigments. And then on the lower right, yeast cells, they are they're going to have a cell wall. Both diatoms and yeast cells have a cell wall, but obviously we know it doesn't contain peptidoglycan, so very different from a bacterial cell wall. So overarchingly, we can just say there's a great deal of diversity amongst the eukaryotic world. Let's take a look at the microbial membership of this world and talk a little bit about the fungi and the protease. These are the representative groups of the eukaryotic microorganisms. And we could further split this down because we already have worked with some of the members of the group fungi. We have worked with yeast, for example, the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a great example of a type of fungus. Remember, that is baker's yeast, but it's also the type of yeast that is used to brew beer and to make wine. And then fungi also incorporate the molds. And later this semester, we'll have an awesome lab lecture called The Fungus Among Us, where we'll talk about both yeast and molds. So you can be looking forward to that lecture. But proteins are another group that are considered eukaryotic microorganisms. And amongst the proteins, we can split them into algae and protozoa. The troubling thing is that algae and protozoa, while that's a term that we still very much use, it's not a technical term because, in fact, there is no phylogenetic grouping called algae or called protozoa. In fact, many of these microorganisms have developed independently on different branches um, of the evolutionary history. So, in fact, some algae are more closely related to protozoa than they are to other algae. And that's why we don't see a phylogenetic grouping or a, um, a distinctive sort of group there. That's just a, a classical name, if you will, for, the, for these organisms. So we can say, perhaps, uh, is just a general course, that eukaryotes are distinguished by those mem membrane-bound nuclei and organelles. I think it was Olivia who said in lecture, you know, hey, they have a membrane-bound nucleus. And that is one thing that we consider to be a quintessential eukaryotic feature and allows us to somewhat make a generalization differentiating, differentiating eukaryotic organisms. So this is something that maybe we can take into our conversation as we begin to look at cell structure. But maybe a lot of you are also thinking about some other differences within the eukaryotic world. And maybe just the idea of the cell wall tipped you off on some of those. We know that some eukaryotes have a cell wall, such as the yeast and the diatoms that we just looked at. But not all eukaryotic organisms have a cell wall. In fact, many of them don't. And so they have to maintain their structure, their cell rigidity, in another way. So you might be thinking of an internal structure called the cytoskeleton. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about within eukaryotes today is the cytoskeleton. Before I begin this though, I'm going to go ahead and rock your boat a little bit one more time to let you know that in fact in 2001 in a study in Oxford it was shown that some bacteria also have cytoskeletal components. So that, that differentiation that, was, that is so popular to make between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is thrown into the washing machine because, in fact, we really can't say that prokaryotes completely lack a cytoskeleton. In fact, we know that some of them have cytoskeletal components. 
However, we can say that as a general course, cytoskeletal components may be more uh, exemplified in a eukaryotic cell. And we'll talk about some of those components here. So let's begin with just a general definition of cytoskeleton providing the structure and shape to the cell, playing a role in movement. And we can split it down into three components, a large, large component, uh, a medium component, and a very tiny component. Let's begin with the large one, the microtubule. Microtubules are, in fact, the largest of the three. They're about 25 nanometers in diameter. And you can see by looking at them that they are long, hollow cylinders. And they make these long, hollow cylinders by having two proteins that repeat and wrap around helically and leave a hollow core. These two proteins are called alpha and beta tubulin. So actually what we might say is that they're two separate polypeptide chains that interact with one another to form the overarching protein tubulin. So let's think that through. If there are two separate polypeptide chains, one of them the alpha chain and one of them the beta chain, they come together to form this tubulin protein. What kind of structure does tubulin have? Right? Two separate polypeptide chains interacting. Hopefully you're yelling at me and saying quaternary structure, right? These, this protein has quaternary structure because we see two separate polypeptide chains coming together to form that overarching protein structure. So a couple of functional things that microtubules do, they form mitotic spindles, they form cilia and flagella, so they're very much involved in motion of the eukaryotic cell. We'll soon talk about the whip-like motion of a eukaryotic flagellum and the way in which microtubules come together in doublets to form the core of eukaryotic flagella. They also provide support. They also can form these structures called axopodia, which are kind of like pseudopodia, but they're uh, much longer, thinner, and more um, highly spiky, if you will. They play a large role in things like radiolaria in the ocean, like Daniel will be interested in this, in the radiolarian life has these spiky kind of protrusions that are axopodia that help them to acquire nutrients and also it helps them with buoyancy, so floating within a marine environment. So microtubules can really play a role there in that way too. Lastly, uh, microtubules play a role as the highways of the cell and in maintenance of shape of the cell. So what we mean by highways is that they actually provide a route on which vesicles can get around in the cell. And in fact, I often like to make an analogy that a eukaryotic cell is kind of like a city that never sleeps. Everything is always in action. And in fact, you might think of the, um, the microtubules as forming the roadways within the cell city. And perhaps the vesicles are the taxi cabs that run around on the highways of the, of the cell. So shape maintenance, another very important role that microtubules have. And a good note to say is that we know that form fits function. So if a, a cell is lacking or is, it has a mutation, it's microtubules, and it lacks its shape, it may also lose its function. Um, a good example of this within a multicellular system, to uh, make an analogy for us, is within neural cells. If they actually lack their microtubules, they uh, really lose their function because they lose their shape. Okay, great. Let's talk about the smallest, tiniest component uh, of the cytoskeleton called the microfilaments. Microfilaments are much smaller than microtubules. In fact, they're between 4 and 7 nanometers in diameter, so often less than five times the size of a microtubule. But they're packed with action. Don't let them fool you, because in fact, these are the actin filaments. So they're all about motion, all about movement, um, shape changes. They are at the heart of pseudopodia, where they allow for... Um, where actin polymerizes and depolymerizes, allowing for the pseudopodes of a phagocytic cell to wrap around whatever prey it's trying to engulf. We see that in this picture here. You can see the long pseudopodia of this amoeba about to reach out and engulf some of the um, surrounding bacterial world likely here that it will take in as a nutrient source. So microfilaments playing a really, really important role in, in that.
let's go ahead and watch a video of this uh, pseudopodia formation and the way that we see the polymerization of actin to allow the pseudopods to grab out and, and keep, uh, keep forming a much longer and longer protrusion. Sweet. Look at that. You can see the actin polymerization heading out, allowing these to get longer. Let's do it again. Backwards. All right. There it is, actin polymerization wrapping around, allowing pseudopodia extension and to allow it to engulf and then, of course, degrade whatever it's able to take in. So clearly, these play a huge role there. Uh, another microbial story with microfilaments is actually to think about the microfilaments in our cells, in host cells, and to think about certain disease-causing pathogens. One great example, if you remember back um, a little less than two years ago, about a year and a half ago, Listeria monocytogenes caused a big to-do outbreak in cantaloupe. And so you probably heard about the cantaloupe uh, contamination of Listeria. Well, Listeria monocytogenes, when it gets into the host cell, it actually gets around and moves around within the host cell by triggering the host cell to, to polymerize actin. And then the Listeria literally rides on the actin like an amusement park ride, and it actually is actually called actin tails of the listeria because it looks like the listeria has a tail because it's causing the polymerization of the actin to push it along uh, and for it to get through the cell that way. So it's a very smooth criminal in its way of getting around the host cell. So our last component of the cytoskeleton is the intermediate filament, about 10 nanometers. You can see it's in between the microfilament and the microtubule, composed of proteins including keratin. So remember keratin in our fingernails, that's a very rigid, very structural protein. Very, very stable elements, very, very supportive, and in fact they look like ropes, so their form fits their function there. The role of intermediate filaments is less well understood and characterized than that of the microfilaments or the microtubules. However, we're going to see it in our next slide when we, talk, we begin to talk about the membrane-bound nucleus of eukaryotic cells. So zooming into the eukaryotic nucleus, we're going to start on the outer edge of the nucleus, looking at the outer and inner nuclear membranes, and together those are called the nuclear envelope. These membranes have areas in which there are large pores in the membrane. So again, unlike the cytoplasmic membrane that is very, very selective, very exclusive, the nuclear membrane actually has pores large enough to allow proteins to pass in and out of the nucleus. It even allows ribosomal subunits, so very large proteins and things like the, the ribosomal subunits of 60 S and the 40S subunits to get in and out. So really these nuclear pores are a transport route. They are, um, you could think of this as a manufacturing plant within, a, within our cellular city and much export and import has to take place. There are molecules that need to get in to regulate gene expression, of course um, proteins that need to get out to be involved in expression of uh, conversion of RNAs into proteins. So there's just a lot of busyness going on and a lot of export and import into and out of the nucleus. Now once you look at uh, supporting the nuclear envelope, we'll find something called the nuclear lamina. The nuclear lamina is comprised of intermediate filaments and these intermediate filaments provide support to the nuclear envelope. These are really important in that supportive role um, and recognizing, again, the highly structural nature of intermediate filaments and the way in which that strength can be very important in this particular context. Looking a little deeper into the nucleus, we can see some uh, component that is not membrane bound, but it is very discreet and succinct. It is called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is famous because it is the spot where ribosomes are assembled. It's also this place where ribosomal RNAs are synthesized. So the DNAs that encode for the ribosomal RNAs are housed here. We call those the RDNAs, and the resulting RNAs that are made from them are the RRNAs, right? The ribosomal RNAs. So this distinct but not membrane-bound, cells may have more than one of them, or maybe just one. 
And when a cell is dividing, it might even be that the nucleolus goes away and you can't really even see it at all. So in non-dividing cells, this is an area that is very visible. But again, it may be only distinct when a cell is not dividing. Let's look, though, at the part of the nucleus that all of you have been waiting for, and that is obviously that it is the storage of the DNA. The DNA can take a couple of different forms within the nucleus. It is always packaged as chromatin. Chromatin is essentially the term that we give for DNA and the associated proteins that package it. So remember when Keenan told us that, in fact, prokaryotic cells do utilize proteins to package their DNA. Well, let me just tell you, eukaryotic cells do it to an even greater extent than prokaryotic cells. A lot of packaging that goes on with uh, eukaryotic chromatin. And in fact, depending upon the stage of life of the cell, in a cell that is non-dividing, the, much of the DNA be, may be very relaxed, very accessible. We call that euchromatin. But in a cell that is actively dividing, we will see that this, the um, condensation of the DNA is extreme. That is, it's packaged very, very highly. And I remember when I asked about what form chromosomes take in a eukaryotic cell, and there was a little bit of confusion about what form they take. They are linear. But somebody said, I think it was Olivia, she said they, they, they make chromosomes, right? She, I, I think she gave the answer that they're like the X-shaped chromosome or something like that. Um, and in fact, this is the point at which you would see the actual chromatids and the chromosomes is when they're very, very tightly, tightly packaged at their most condensed. So in heterochromin, when, chromatin, when we see that very, very tight packaging, the genes on the chromosomes are not particularly accessible. And in fact, there's something called the accessibility hypothesis that says that one of the ways in which gene expression is regulated is actually through this packaging. Let's take a look at the very base level of packaging of this eukaryotic DNA. The very first way in which the DNA gets wrapped around a group of proteins in order to begin to condense, in order to begin to um, package down. You could think about this as being kind of like thread or yarn. If you just had all your yarn linear out throughout the entire house, that would be an absolute disaster, right? In order to store it, we bundle it and we package it with thread. We put it around spools. And the same thing is true of DNA. It would be very, very uh, cumbersome if it weren't packaged. So the first level of packaging is just that the DNA that I'm showing in red here wraps one and three quarters times around a group of proteins called the histone proteins. Now, this, this is about 154 base pairs of DNA that wrap around these proteins. And then there's about 56 base pairs that that leaves that is linker DNA. That linker DNA uh, is associated with another protein, this protein called histone H1. So we have the histone octamer, which is called an oct octamer because there's two copies each of four histone proteins. And those associate with the DNA. And histone H1 also associates with the DNA. So remembering back, remembering that DNA always has the sugar phosphate backbone, and that sh the phosphate molecules, remember, are anions. They're negatively charged ions. So they're going to be likely to want to interact with positively charged molecules. So I bet you can guess what kinds of amino acids are super rich in a histone octamer. We know that they must be the basic amino acids. So for practice, review what two amino acids are very rich in the histone octamer and thus really allow for great DNA packaging because it's a love-love relationship, right? The DNA with its negative charge loves to wrap around the histone octamer with its positive charge. And when we look at the packaging as a whole, we see the histone octamer, its associated DNA, the linker DNA, and histone H1 all together forming what we call the nucleosome. The nucleosome is considered the core packaging unit of DNA. I'm going to stop today, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. We will kick things off next time with cheesy demo, demo uh, of histone octamers and how DNA associates with those to form the base level packaging uh, of DNA in a eukaryotic cell. So once again, have a great weekend. 
and get ready for that exam. And hopefully I'll see everybody at one of the review sessions on Monday.